praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Respected deans and deputy deans and heads of department, the professors and students here at the International Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our subject, a very important subject, is entitled Surah Al Kahf, or as the Malay pronounce it, Surah Al Kahfi. Surah Al Kahf and the different dimensions of space and of time. The companions of the Prophet were sitting talking amongst themselves. When he, the Prophet came and asked, what are you talking about? And they said, we are talking about the signs of the last day. And then he said, that only a prophet could speak. That the last day would not come, and then he mentioned ten signs. And these have come to be known as the ten major signs. <coughs> they are located in Sahih Bukhari, they are located in Sahih Muslim. And they have not been given in the chronological sequence in which they will occur. Number one, the job the false messiah who will seek to impersonate the true messiah. Number two, God and my God, yet Jews and Matthews, who are human beings. Endowed by Allah with great power, indestructible power. But who use their power to oppress, who are essentially godless. Number three, the return of the son of Mary, the most powerful voice in history. The most powerful voice in history. The prophesy. The return of the true Messiah, the son of Mary. Nabi Isa alayhi salam is the voice of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number four. Dukhan, smoke, something which will envelop the scars. My opinion, and whenever I give my opinion, I urge that my opinion should never be accepted unless and until you are convinced that it is correct. That that Dukhan is probably 20, 25 years away from now. This is coming and going. We have an engineering problem here. A movement of the earth, a shaking of the earth, in which the earth moves and sinks down, something sinks down. 
one in the east, one in the west, and one in Arabia. Number 10, that a fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of assembly. We are concerned in these 10 with number one, the job. There is a chapter in this book, Jerusalem in the Quran, which was written 10 years ago, on the job. I am now attempting to write a book on the subject of the job. I don't know how many years it's going to take before I can finish it. The John is a being created by Allah, but an evil being. No human being, no human being has been created evil. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ No human being has been created evil. No jinn has been created evil. Allah has created the human being and the jinn and then given them the free choice. A self-directed will, freedom of will to choose. And it is their choice whether they be believers or disbelievers. That's what it means to be a human being or a jinn. The jinn has no such choice. He's created as an evil being. Human beings and jinn are going to stand before Allah for judgment and will either be rewarded or punished with heaven or hell. Not so for the jinn because he's created as an evil being. Well, Allah speaks of that at the end of the Quran. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَبْرِ مَا خَلَقِ Allah creates evil. Where is that evil? Here is the evil. It's the job. This evil being has been programmed to impersonate the true Messiah. And of course we know about the true Messiah that he is to return. When they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, they boasted. him. إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيْسَ بْنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ We will kill him. What they did not know, and no one knew for 600 years, was no, they did not kill him. No, they did not crucify him. Allah made it appear like that. Allah raised it. But where did he go? If Allah raised him. And he is to come back. In fact, his return is not only one of the ten we just mentioned, but in Surah Al-Fusilat, وَإِنَّهُ And this word can be recited two ways. The Arab did not come down with Jibra'il of Islam. وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمٌ لِلسَّعَةِ وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِلسَّعَةِ And surely he, Jesus, is the sign sign paraxilas, the sign of all signs, the key to the subject, meaning his return. And Nabi Muhammad said that when he returns, he's going to be Hakim, one who rules, establish his government, establish his rule. And his rule will be a rule which cannot be rivaled. And hence the ruling power in the world. And he will rule from the throne of Nabi Dawood al Islam according to the Torah. From the holy state of Israel. And if you establish an Israel with a rule which cannot be challenged by any other rule, then this qualifies as a ruling state. And so if the Dajjal has to impersonate the true Messiah and deceive Banu Israel into accepting him as the true Messiah, since they rejected the true Messiah, he also will have to rule the world from Jerusalem. In order to do that, number one, he'd have to liberate the Holy Land from Muslim rule. And this analysis is already here in this book. 
and he's already done that. In 1917, he'll have to bring the, the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. He's already done that. He has already done that. Between 1918 and 1948, he'll have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get the Jews to believe that this is the Holy Israel of David and of Solomon He's already done that. When Israel was born in 1948, he'd have to cause that Israel to become once again the ruling state in the world. Israel is boasting today that they control the United States of America. They do it openly. Ariel Sharon said, we control the United States. And every political scientist knows <laughs> that the Jews control the American Congress. So Israel is already ruling the world from behind the hijab. But Israel has to rule the world without any hijab. And that is about to occur. We can now anticipate events to occur. We are not prophets. We don't have angels and jinn whispering into our head. What nonsense. If a businessman can anticipate events in the market, why can't we anticipate events as well in the world of politics and economics? What's wrong with that? Well, if Israel is about to rule the world, well then we don't have wait to wait long before the Dajjal will appear, said the Prophet born of Jewish parents, appear as a human being, ruling the world from Jerusalem, and declaring, I am the Messiah. In fact, 15 years ago, I said, we are probably 50 years away from that event. And they laughed at me in New York. They're not laughing anymore today. <laughs> no. So I changed my wording and I said, well, children now at school should live to see it and nobody quarrels anymore. Well, then where is the job? If it appears very clear, he's already accomplished most of his mission. We turn now to the famous hadith known as the hadith of Tamim al-Dari. Time seems to move faster in the Department of Engineering. <laughs> in the rest of the world, I wonder why. We <laughs> go to the hadith of Tamim al-Dari in Sahih Muslim. Tamim al-Dari was a Christian Palestinian converted, became Muslim and came to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina and said, narrated something to him. It was either an actual event or a dream or a vision. My understanding, it was a vision. My opinion, it's a vision. And then the Prophet said to the people, sit down, I have something to say to you. Tabi Madari came to me and told me something about the Dajjal which confirms what I've been saying to you. Then we have the event narrated from the lips of the Prophet ﷺ. The Tamim Madari and some companions, 40 of them, went on board a ship. And a storm blew the ship for a whole month until they came to land and it was an island. We're not told how they knew it was. And when they got on shore, they were confronted by a very hairy creature or beast with so much hair, you could hardly tell which side was head and which side was tail. And then the beast spoke and said, I am Jassasa, Jassasa, spy. So it's an island about one mile journey by sea from the Arab world. And an island with expertise in spying and espionage. I usually have James Bond kind of stuff. <laughs> so Jasasa said, there's someone waiting for you, pointing 
to a monastery which was lying in ruins. So we know that this is an island in which eventually religion will crumble, will be in ruins. And their churches and monasteries are going to be sold to McDonald's and to Pizza Hut and to you name it. An island will eventually become essentially atheist. And they hurried to that monastery lying in ruins, and there they found the job. He was in chains, his hands chained to his neck, and his feet chained. And he asked a number of questions and then declared, I am the job. And when I am released, he's not as yet released. So up to the third year, perhaps, in Medina, he had not as yet been released. When I'm released, I'll enter every town and every city, but he didn't mention Kampung. <laughs> he didn't mention villages, no, town and cities. And so from this hadith we know that when the jar is released, it is from an island, this island, that he will launch his mission to eventually rule the world from the Holy Land, from Jerusalem. Which island is it? In this book, I offered an answer, my opinion. Island is Britain. And I gave the evidence to support my view. But the Prophet went on to say that when the jar is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day, Yawmun Kasana, one day which would be like a year. Yawmun Kashahar, one day which would be like a month. We do have some scholars of physics here tonight, today. Yawmun Kajuma, one day which would be like a week. وَسَائِرُ أَيَّامِهِ كَأَيَّامِكُمْ And all his days, meaning all the rest of his days, like your days. In this book, Jerusalem in the Quran, I have argued that when the Dajjal was on earth, but in a day which is like a year, and not in our dimension of space and time, and we cannot see him. And with Britain as his headquarters, I wish I could use a better word than headquarters, we notice strange things happening in the world. Namely, we found Britain becoming the ruling state in the world. And this was known as Pax Britannica in the language of international relations. And then, and of course, lots of relationship, unusual, baffling, mysterious relations between Britain and the Holy Land, between Britain and the Zionist movement. And then we found that there came a time when Britain was no longer the ruling state of the world. And Pax Britannica gave way to Pax Americana. And the United States became the next ruling state of the world. And we suggested, or rather we argued, that this is the Dajjal in a day which is like a month. And then we said, well, the United States, Pax Americana will not last forever. In fact, it's going to last much less period of time than Pax America and Pax Britannica. And we are now living at that moment in time when Pax Americana is giving way to a third ruling state of the world, when Israel will take over from the United States, and this will be Pax Judaica. This is the first book to offer this thesis. To the best of my knowledge, it has not as yet been refuted in any scholarly way. But the book has provoked profound silence from the word of Islamic scholarship. It has neither been 
embrace, nor has it been rejected strangely. I want to turn now to Surah Al-Kaf because while there is no reference in the Quran to Dajjal by name, no, and this is the divine wisdom. Nabi Muhammad wasalam, has made a reference to Dajjal connected to the Quran. He said, recite the first ten verses of Surah Al-Kaf for protection from the fitna of Dajjal. And then he also said that Dajjal sees with his left eye. He's blind in the right eye. He looks like a bulging ring. But your Lord is not one eye. And every mu'min will be able to read the word kafir written between his, on his forehead between his eyes. Whether the, the, the mu'min is kafir or gayro kafir, whether he's literate or illiterate, he'll still be able to read. And our conclusion was that, that this was religious symbolism. Uh, and I have to hurry up with the lecture, otherwise we'll run out of time. That this was religious symbolism. And that the left eye symbolizes knowledge externally acquired, scientific knowledge. And the blind right eye symbolizes internal blindness. That the Western epistemology is wrong. That knowledge comes only from external observation and experimentation. And that the epistemology of the Quran is correct. That there are two sources of knowledge. One external and the other internal, that the heart can see. In the first two chapters of his book, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, the eminent Indian, well there was no Pakistan at that time, scholar Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, in the first two chapters of his book, argued in the best epistemological defense I've ever read of the epistemology of the Quran argued the validity of knowledge internally acquired. But if the heart is to see, the heart knows, needs no more. And the Prophet said, Allah's blessing be upon him, ittaku firasat al-mu'min, fear, the penetrating, internal, intuitive, spiritual insight and wisdom of the believer, the mu'min. For innahu yanzuru bin nurillah, because when he sees, he sees with more than a PhD from MIT. He sees with the nur of Allah. And Allah gives his nur to whomsoever Allah chooses to give. It is when Allah gives us nur in the heart that we can see what otherwise cannot be seen internally. And so, in response to Dajjal's attack, where he seeks to reduce mankind to internal blindness, so the mind is clutter up with knowledge and information externally acquired but internally blind. Allah sent Surah to Kaf and the Prophet said Alayhi Salaam to recite he said recite Surah to Kaf on the day of Jum'ah and you will receive Noor from the Samawai to the Ark. And that nur will stay with you until the next Jumar. And it is with that nur that we now seek to focus attention on the story of the young men in the cave and to, dem to demonstrate its link and its relevance to the study, the study of the subject of the job. These were young men who had faith and who proclaimed their faith. They didn't care about whether they lose their job or lose their promotion or lose their esteem amongst their peers or lose their <laughs> US visa <laughs> or their green card. No. 
they stood up and they proclaimed the truth without regard for consequences. And any time you do that, they will target you. And these young men were targeted. And they therefore had to make hijra, a word which is now very strange in the vocabulary of modern Muslims. A hijra. And they fled to a cave and prayed to Allah for protection. As many of us will have to do tomorrow. And Allah put them to sleep. فَضَرَبْنَا عَلَىٰ آذَانِهِمْ فِي الْكَهْفِ السِّنِينَ عَدَدًا And they slept for many years. And then Allah woke them up at the end of their sleep. They slept for 300 years. 300 solar, 309 lunar. Why did he put them to sleep for such a long period of time? Was it only for protection? So they'll be safe? No, that's not the real reason. That is peripheral. Allah put them to sleep to teach the subject of time. That's why he put them to sleep. To teach the subject of time. And so now we go to this event to learn something about time. Sunlight entered the cave in the mornings and in the late afternoon. وَنُقَلِّبُهُمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ وَذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ And the bodies of the young men rolled morning to the right and then rolled evenings to the left. So constantly every day there is this rolling this way and that way. And if you and I were there we would have fled in fright. What a strange thing going on there. How is it possible for the physical body, the physical body, because what is it that is rolling? It's the physical body. Is it rolling in this world of space? Yes. Left and right. Is it rolling, rolling in this world of time? Yes. Morning and evening. Why is it rolling? Attracted to sunlight. Which sunlight? The sunlight here in this world. How is it possible for the human body to survive for 300 years? Where will the human body get the energy from to roll for 300 years? No food, no water. For 300 years. Allah is teaching us a subject death. At the end of the 300 years, we woke them up. And then they questioned each other, how long have we been here? And one of them said to the other, maybe, maybe a day or a part of a day. An answer to which I responded with utter astonishment. What's wrong with him? Can't he see? If you have been there in the cave for 300 years and then you wake up, the evidence would be visible. Your fingernails will be as long as from Ampang Point to KLCC. <laughs> it is now clear that the reason why he said a day or a part of a day is because the young men did not spend 300 years in biological time. Their bodies did not age biologically. 
but their bodies were here in this world of space and time. And yet their bodies did not age biologically. What explanation could there be for it? Well, we toyed for a moment with the idea, well, maybe they were in the Samawat. Because you know in the Samawat, you don't age. Uh, women don't have to buy cosmetics. Not in the Samawat. Hmm? And that is the explanation. That after 300 years, they were still at the same age as they were when they went to sleep. But then we had a problem with that. How could we say that they were in the Samawat when they were, the evidence is staring us in the face that they were here in this material universe. That is the Samawat and this is the material universe. The universe of space and time as we know space and time. Hmm? Why? because the bodies were rolling to the left and to the right and they were rolling morning and evening. How do we explain their survival after 300 years without food and water? How do we explain the passage of 300 years without any biological evidence of aging. What is the link between their survival, the fulfillment of their need for energy, and the sunlight to which they were exposed? These are questions beyond my competence to answer. We can only offer a hypothesis and that is that it is possible for a human being to be simultaneously in the material universe as well as in the Samawa. That it is possible for the human being to penetrate the Samawa, the different dimensions of space and time. This happened in the Mirage of the Prophet Muhammad that there was also backward and forward movement in the mirage. Perhaps a lesson was being taught to us when on two occasions Burak came down or rather Burak re-entered this material universe. On the first occasion the Prophet dismounted from Burak and there was a container with water, with a lid on the water, on the container. He removed the lid, he drank the water, he replaced the lid. And when that caravan arrived uh, in Mecca, this is Mecca, not Medina, the caravan confirmed that this actually happened, the water was drunk. And then Burak came down a second time and the Prophet where there was another caravan asleep and called out to the people the camel had broken loose. And they confirmed when they arrived in Makkah that yes we heard a voice in the night time calling to us that your camel had broken loose and we woke up and we did find that the camel had broken loose and we caught the camel. And so during the Mi'raj or the Isra from Mecca to Jerusalem there was backward and forward movement 
between the Samavat and the material universe. We have in the in Surah to Sabah another glimpse of the subject when Suleiman alayhi salam turned to the jinn and asked for the throne of the queen of Sabah to be brought and it was brought in the twinkling of an eye and so it is possible if you are able to penetrate the different worlds of space and time, it is possible to transport objects over long distances in the twinkling of an eye. In the story which is not the story, the event which is narrated in Surah Al-Baqarah, a traveler was passing by a town which was lying in ruins. And uh, it had been universally accepted that it's Jerusalem. And he said, I don't think that this could ever be raised again. And Allah caused him to die. And then after a hundred years, he was raised back to life. And he asked, he was asked, how long have you been here? And he said, a day or a part of a day. But Allah said, no, you've been here for a hundred years. Now look at your food, love yet a I don't know if it's roti chanai or biryani. A hundred years had passed. It was lying there. It was lying there in this world of space and time, this material universe. And yet, like the bodies of the young men, did not suffer the effects of biological time, the passage of time. And so the food was simultaneously in this world of space and time, this material universe, and yet also in the uh, Samavat. Finally, they ask him for a miracle. And he'd always pointed to the Quran, this is my miracle. But on the authority of the Quran itself, we have evidence of a miracle. When he pointed to the moon, <laughs> he pointed to the moon. And the evidence came from travelers who were traveling from a great distance away. That yes, we saw the moon with one half of the moon on this side of the mountain and the other half on that side of the mountain. We saw it. In other words, projecting tremendous power. I hope the Pentagon does listen to this lecture. Projecting tremendous power. Power which traverses beyond this world of space and time. Power which then traverses the Samawat and then re enters this world of space and time, this material universe, to split the moon in half. There seems to be a lot for us to learn about time and about the different worlds of time, about space and about the different worlds of space. There seems to me that there are lessons being taught in the Quran 
but amateurs like myself cannot penetrate those lessons. I'm reminded of my teacher, Maulana Fadur Rahman Ansari, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, who taught us Islam at the, <coughs> the Alim Institute of Islamic Studies in Pakistan. And uh, he was a philosopher, not a scientist. But he used to be constantly lecturing on the subject of time. And uh, I remember him quoting this hadith of Qudsi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La tasubbu dahr fa inni anadda. Do not abuse time. Because I, Allah, I am time. In other words, there is eternal time. There's endless time. There's absolute time. In addition to different dimensions of time. Last night, you saw your neighbor's house on fire. Burning down. This morning at 10 o'clock, you passed by your neighbor's house and you saw it on fire. So you scratch your head. How could I see last night that which did not, did not occur until this morning? <coughs> Is there such a thing as a true dream? Of course, scientists have all work to do now. <laughs> a true dream is a universal phenomenon. Your wife normally has true dreams, doesn't she? But what is the explanation? What is the metaphysical explanation of a true dream? We have an explanation in Islam. And that is that events exist before they occur. We know they're going to attack Pakistan. We know for certain that they have to destroy Pakistan, nuclear plants and nuclear weapons and denuclearize Pakistan and mainly break up Pakistan in the process. We know that they have to ensure that the world of Islam does not possess a nuclear deterrent before Israel can wage her big wars to subdue the Arabs around the state of Israel and the world of Islam. We know that. But it would be helpful, wouldn't it, wouldn't it, if we know when that event is going to take place. Events exist before they occur. And so the fire existed in the Samawat before the fire occurred in the material universe. The event had been created by Allah, but he was not responsible for it. And the event had to pass through the different worlds of space and time before it could eventually unfold and occur in this world. And so it would be manifestly beneficial in terms of gathering information I mean, even President Ronald Reagan had one of these people in the White House, you know. The people who read your hand and who read the coffee cup and stuff. Ronald Reagan had one of them. <laughs> it would be manifestly beneficial if we could understand the subject of the different dimensions of space and time. And we could penetrate <laughs> the different dimensions of space and time for the purpose of giving benefit to the Ummah at this critical moment in our history. A 
I am conscious of the fact that, and with this we end, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared, Allah nur as samawati wa Allah. That Allah is the nur of the heavens and of the earth. And therefore, I offer the opinion that it is light which has to be studied. That it is with light that we can penetrate the other worlds of space and time. And then finally I offer one more comment before we turn over to the specialist here. That in Surah Tul uh, Mulk, in Surah Tul Mulk of the Quran, Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَوَاتٍ تِوَاقَ مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تَفَارُ فَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرَ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُتُو ثُمَّ ارْجِعِ الْبَصَرَ قَرَّتَيْنِ يَنْقَلِبِ لَيْكَ الْبَصَرُ خَاسِيًا وَهُوَ حَسِيًا That it is Basira which travels on the vehicle of Noor. The vehicle for penetrating the Samawat is Noor. But the passenger on the vehicle who will actually observe the Samawat is Basira. That we can at least be able to observe. Hal tara min futur? Have you, do you see? Allah is asking us, do you see? Hence it's possible for us to penetrate and to therefore observe the Samawat. This has been uh, an introduction to the subject of Surah Al Kafi and the Samawat, and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless us to further our understanding and our knowledge of the subject. Uh, there's one thing I forgot, and that is that there's a chapter in this book, written of course by an amateur, uh, Surah Al-Kafir in the modern age, I think it is chapter 2, in which I have attempted an explanation of the subject of the Quran and time. After the Sheikh has given his, um, his um, very insightful talk, so inshallah those will be the question and answer session, so I would like to, uh, what should be the modality? Questions will be posed pertaining to the presentation so that we can make them wait for the next part, the far more interesting part. Not a question and answer, the far more interesting part is where we have comments and our scholars present here will have a chance to offer their views to take the subject further to where I took it. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, this morning after but I, I came uh, to home and uh, I read Surah Ka. I made some calculations and I came to idea about it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said one day in the race it was 1,000 years. Okay? If, uh, this is a linear equation. If you calculate this 100, uh, 300 and 309, you will find it about seven hours. It's a sleeping time day. If we sleep at night and we raise up about five o'clock for Salah, it is uh, this seven hours. What do you think about that? <laughs> Any other question concerning the Sheikh's presentation here? Yeah. Sorry, I... Um, I would like to go back to the beginning of your presentation when you talked about the signs. 
Um, actually, before that, small technical problems, you mentioned something about decimal. You said maybe in 25 years or something like that. I'd like to ask about it. Okay, but moving away from the subject, I'll answer you. All right. Um, just go here. Give me Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. Yeah. And it's nothing to do with Gog and Magog in the modern world. I have made an effort to look at the subject in the modern age, in a scholarly way. Uh, it's the last book I've written. I have identified the Magog of the Quran with modern day Russia. I have identified the Gog of the Quran with the Anglo American Israeli NATO alliance. And uh, I am anticipating the clash of the two to be what is hinted at in the Quran in Surah Al Kahf. وَتَرَكْنَا بَعْدَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِي The two bodies of water can either crash against each other or two bodies of water can merge with each other. I think all the meanings are here. وَتَرَكْنَ بَعْضَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِيمَا The clash of Gog and Magog seems to me to be around the corner, maybe 20-25 years from now. A nuclear war that many, many great scholars have already anticipated. And that after that war takes place, the war that comes after that will be fought with bows and arrows. <laughs> if a nuclear weapon explodes, it produces a mushroom cloud. <coughs> What's going to happen when thousands of nuclear weapons explode? And goodbye Chicago, goodbye New York, goodbye LA. My gosh, heaven has disappeared. <laughs> Goodbye Moscow. Goodbye Singapore. But nobody is going to miss Singapore. I want to suggest that it is that coming nuclear war which I describe as the Gog and Magog war that is going to produce the Dukhan. The Jal has ruled the world from Jerusalem. He therefore has forced the submission of the Arabs and the submission of the Muslims. This is coming now. The Arab uprisings are meant to prepare the way for the war that's going to be launched on the Arabs. But there are two powerful forces in the world, both nuclear armed which would not bend their knees before Israel. The United States could enter into a number of treaties with them and appear to be friendly. But Putin is not a fool. No. And Russia will not submit to Israel ruling over Russia. And China will not submit to Israel ruling over China. That's not going to happen. And that's why Russia is being surrounded now by nuclear missiles. Surrounded by nuclear missiles after the demise of the Soviet Union. And so the attack on Russia and the attack on China must take place. No getting away. If our eschatology is correct, if the prophet is correct about the Jal, the false messiah. So I believe that that is the Dukhan that is coming. Any other
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I'm just taking this question a bit further. Uh, uh, you, you were foreseeing something and you talked about it today. My question is the same question. I'm repeating, but roughly, if I ask again, but I want your answer. As to why can I acquire a shack? I hope it's the first video or thank you. Allah Iqbal asked the question then and you asking the question Allah now. Iqbal asked the question then and you are asking the question so now. Why I want to pass why can't I have one shark? Oh nations of the East, so what is to be done? You are you are forcing certain things. But what are we to do? Just sit down and do nothing or to do something. What are we to do? Thank you. Uh, our subject of today's discussion is basically scientific. I would rather that we realize the time that we have. I came here to learn today, really, than to teach. And uh, the, the question why it is an important one uh, is directed towards how should the world of Islam respond? Okay? Uh, I believe that one of the ways that we can respond is to study this subject. Study this subject. Because in this subject I believe there is very, there's very important knowledge for us. For example, I did give an example. I did give an example. I said we know that they are going to attack Pakistan nuclear plants and nuclear weapons. And it will be beneficial for us if we have advance notice. Okay? Uh, uh, Omar radiallahu ta'ala was standing on the member giving the khutbah. The Muslim army was thousands of miles away fighting on the battlefield of jihad. And he was able to anticipate an attack which was about to be launched from the rear. How did he see it? And he called out to the commander-in-chief of the Muslim army and said to him, to the rear, watch to the rear. When he returned to Medina, he confirmed that he got the command and he directed his attention to the rear from where an attack was about to be launched and he was able to take preventative action. Why can't we now make the effort to penetrate the subject to such an extent that we can protect our people the way he protected the Muslim army? Mm -hmm. I have some ideas on the subject, but they are not scientific. And I am hoping today that we get some scientific input into the subject here. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure. Is that a lot of from this? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I would like to comment about the subject uh, and the relation between the life and time itself. Um, you, you, you give a, an example about the dream and the possibility that the events that already occurring in the Samawat and the oh, other existing. existing in the Samawat and later on they will uh, appear in the physical oh, yeah. Yeah, dimension of, of exist there yeah, and now they appear yeah, yeah. um, so my first branch of the uh, question is so what's, what's the uh, implication of, of this thing in relation to the um, uh, predestined choices that we make since the, uh, the events already occurred, and let's say uh, uh, a house is burning already opened the Samawa, is it? Uh, and you have a dream about it, and later on it happens um, in the physical uh, world of, of us, in the dimension uh, world. So, uh, in this case, we, we are provided with, with choices, isn't it? So what's, what's your comment about, this is the first that I, I, I need to uh, give. So what's the, the, yeah, what's the relation between the given choice and we, the ability of us and the ability of our to make the choice itself in this, uh, in this scenario in relation to the time. Okay, yeah. 
no knowledge of events which already exist. You can reach us unless Allah permits it. And uh, He has been doing that all through the history of this Ummah, even before that. In the phenomenon of true dreams and true visions, there are four of them in Surah to Yunus, I'm uh, sorry, Surah to Yusuf, four of them. And there is one of Ibrahim alayhi salam, seeing in his dream, sacrificing his son. Uh, probably three or four, two or three more others in the Quran, probably seven or eight or more in the Quran. And even in the Sirah, many companions receiving true dreams and visions. Nabi Muhammad والسلام, receiving true dreams and visions. So this is a phenomenon which has been recurring in the history of his Ummah. It is nothing new. Sometimes the knowledge that comes makes us smile. And we are happy. This is Bushra, a good news for the believers. But what about the fellow who saw birds picking bread on his head? <laughs> and Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam gave him the meaning of that vision. It's a vision. It wasn't good news, bad news being conveyed to him. Uh, and so the communication that comes from the other world can be good, can be bad. Uh, but nothing can occur without Allah's knowledge. Nothing. Even the act of suicide. And we actually get away from our subject today now. <laughs> I didn't want this to happen. Allah knows everything. Yes. But Allah is not responsible for your choice. You are responsible for your choice. When you are given knowledge of that which is to occur, it is sometimes to give you a warning, to give you a chance to redeem yourself because you do not know what is the last thing written. When you are given knowledge of that which is to occur, sometimes it is to give you solace in your lonesome heart, to give you solace in your grieving heart. Hold on, don't give up. Because the sun is going to shine tomorrow, as it did for the young men in the cave. Sometimes you're given knowledge in order to build morale. And sometimes you're given knowledge in order to point to you in what direction you should go. And so after Badr, and after Uhad, and after Khandak, and after the enemy had given everything he could give to warfare, and he's not been successful in eliminating us. Then came the vision of making tawaf around the Kaaba. And so Nabi Muhammad gave the announcement, I'm heading to Makkah. This is called a peace offensive in international relations. A peace offensive, brilliantly planned and brilliantly executed. And it placed the enemy on the horns of a dilemma. I mean, this is absolutely brilliant. So communication can come from this Tanawa, through dreams, through visions, which are of different kinds. 
and it is for us in today's session to try not just to understand the subject from the point of view of quantum mechanics or the theory of relativity uh, uh, um, as to whether gravity belongs to the material universe or whether gravity is something which is shared by the Samoa. Hmm? More important than the understanding of this subject, more important than that, is the capacity to penetrate the Samoa. What is the methodology of penetrating the Samoa? And we want a scientific answer. Thank you for your uh, beneficial talk. I have, you have been beneficial for me last uh, five years. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. So I have a comment on this uh, subject today that uh, the Prophet taught us uh, about the dream. Uh, he said, how do we see dream? When we sleep, the roof, it comes out of our body and then it travels. So according to my understanding, look, is Noor. So according to Einstein, he said that when you have a speed, more than the speed of light, you can uh, pass big different dimensions of time. You can travel through different dimensions of time. Since the rope is light, so according to my understanding, this, uh, this rope can travel uh, more than the speed of light. So, when we see dream, according to the scientists, the duration of a dream is like three seconds or four seconds. So I'm not a good student, sometimes I sleep in the class. Just like this, I go like this and I explain the dream to my friend for like hours. So he says, you have just slept for like three seconds, how can you explain this to me for like hours and hours? So time here, like three seconds I slept and I have a dream of like hours. So the I don't understand this subject, but I'm not an engineering student or science student. So if you have any insight of this, why time differs here and there when we see dreams? Well, I have one thing in common with you. We both used to sleep in the classroom. <laughs> we both used to sleep in the classroom. The, the roof is created from Noor, very clearly you are correct. That Allah causes the nafs of the roof, the nafs. To be taken out of the body at the time of mouth mouth being the definition of mouth the definition of mouth which no medical professor can give the definition of mouth, definition of mouth is when Allah takes the soul and does not return it okay that is mouth oh can it be otherwise can it be otherwise? When Allah takes the soul, and I'm using the English language, I should not. When Allah takes the nafs, the nafs, and does not return it. What is the nafs? We can use the word soul, perhaps, but it could be confusing. It's better to use the word self. S-E-L-F, self. Okay. In Surah to Zubah, I hope we don't have any bankers present here. You know, people who lend money and interest. You know what Allah could do to them in the grave, right? Allah who yatawaffal amfusahina mawtiha. Allah who yatawaffal amfus. Amfus, not rule. 
Allah takes the anfus, Allah takes the nafs at the time of maut. <coughs> nafs, the self. Maut, death. وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُدْ فِي مَنَامِهَا Which surah is this? Huh? Oh, somebody didn't have breakfast this morning. No? Zumar is correct. Allahu يَتَوَفَّ الْأَنْفُ سَعِينَ مَوْتِهَا Allah takes the nafs at the time of maut. وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُدْ فِي مَنَامِهَا For those who do not experience mouth while they are awake, Allah takes the nafs while they are asleep. فَيُمْسِكُ الَّذِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَى أَجَلِ الْمُسَمَّةِ He then keeps those nafs for whom mouth is ordained and then returns the rest for a determined period of time. In other words, the nafs can leave the body. And while the nafs has left the body, because death has not been ordained, the body will not decompose. No. If the nafs is taken from the body and mouth is there, then the body will decompose. But you're going to have to wait a couple of days to see that. I didn't know that. So they took the bank up. They thought he was dead. This is how Allah punishes in the grave. And they gave him the ghusl. And they clothed him with the kafan. And you know the smell of the camphor from the bath. And they performed the salatul janaza thinking he was dead. Allahumma inni a'uzu bika min azaab al qabr. We make dua of Allah ta'ala. Kindly protect us from this punishment. This is one of the punishments of the grave. One of them. And then they buried him. <laughs> when they buried him, they forgot, forgot to leave a cell phone inside there. <laughs> and, then, and then Allah returned the soul. When he returned the soul, he, he woke up as from a sleep. It happens every night. And then, <laughs> why is the place so dark? So dark. So dark. He calls out to his wife, no answer. Yeah. And then he turns to get up. He cannot get up. No space to get up. And he's in a state of utter confusion. Utter confusion. Utter confusion. I tell you, when you and I think about this, that this can happen to us. It's a wake up call, right? It's a wake up call. And then he lies down with insects crawling over his body. And insects biting him. Can't do anything. And be conscious of the fact that Allah is terrible in his punishment and he's in his own urine and he's in his own stool he's smelling his own stool and now you know what is Allah's punishment so from this we know that the nafs can leave the body the nafs can travel the nafs can travel and the nafs can return to the body with the knowledge of what it has seen and experienced while traveling. Is this the route? Is this the route through which we can experience the Samoa? 
if it is that Allah has to choose you, you can make dua for it, you can make ibadah, but only if Allah chooses you would the angel take the nafs out of the body. And the nafs can then travel. Hmm? But in Surah al Mulk, Surah al Mulk, Farji'il Basara al Tara min Futur, it's not the nafs which is traveling, but Basira. It is vision which travels. So you and I have, you and I have one thing in common we used to sleep in the classroom. And in sleep you sometimes have visions. And a vision will give you in an instant that which can encompass a world. Because this is this dimension of time and that is that dimension of time. Where are the scientists? I have uh, three brief points. Uh, the first point is about uh, the jar. And my question is about uh, your interpretation of the jar and its identification with the Sai. Because that can give us a type of uh, feeling that this will happen, that this should happen. So this type of uh, predestined fatalistic uh, interpretation may not be um, fair for, for Muslims <laughs> to surrender to that reality, if it is the right reality. But this regard, my question is the same like the uh, Iranian question. And my second point is about dreams. Well, I did say, whenever I give my opinion, kindly reject my opinion. I ask of you, kindly reject it and do not accept it unless and until you are convinced that it is correct. Otherwise, I'd be disappointed in you. This is the way my own teacher trained me. And this is the way I want to train my students, okay? Uh, if you say that I'm wrong, then you must tell me what is right. But do not accept my opinion. I want to say it one more time to all of you here, the students. When I give my opinion, do not accept it until you are convinced that it is correct. And for that, you've got to do research. For example, if we have the time, the age of Aisha, when you say, when you say, and Bukhari says, the Prophet married now, which is a lie. Go ahead. Thank you very much for that <laughs> clarification. Uh, the second point is about uh, dreams. Sometimes dreams can also be false. Uh, Shatanic dreams. So it's also in, the, in practice difficult to distinguish which dream is true and which dream is uh, Shatanic. All right. There's a book outside entitled, no, no, we are out of print of that book, Dreams in Islam. Um, but uh, do please remind me to schedule a lecture on this subject of dreams in Islam. Dreams are of three kinds. The Prophet explained. They are dreams which are from Allah, they are dreams which are from Shaitan, and they are dreams which are from the old nafs. How can you distinguish between dreams? That's one question. What, are, what is the interpretation of dreams? That's another question. This subject is not taught by anyone. You can't study it in any book. Only Allah gives the knowledge of the interpretation of dreams. However, to distinguish between a dream which has come from Allah and the dream which has come from Shaitan and the dream which has come from your own nafs, it is intuitive insight that gives you the answer to that question. Yes, please. And the third point is about um, Surah al Kahn itself. Well, the Quran refers to and, uh, Ashab al Kahn. 
ونقلبهم that God himself tries to God himself tells them on different sides um, and this uh, indicates probably that people could not move they were not sleeping and this was a different um, stage um, probably like someone is like caravan is moving and we remain behind, we stay behind and we go to the caravan, the time is moving and we are here I think every married man knows that when you sleep, you move and your wife moves. It happens every night when sleeping. Huh? You can be asleep and yet you can move from side to side. Yeah. Um, <coughs> when the Quran says they were asleep, they were asleep. But the Quran said they were moving from left to right, they were moving from left to right, quite a I think this is clear from the Quran. Dr. Mira. Assalamualaikum, Mr. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, interesting uh, talk. I'm also not a scientist, but I'm really interested in this uh, topic. So I have a question. Uh, so remember in the story of uh, the uh, Sulaiman, eh, Ali Salam? The person who brought the throne of uh, Queen Sheba brought it within a uh, split of a second. And it's mentioned in the Quran there is one who has been given the Ilmul Kitab to able to do it. In other words, if you have the Ilmul Kitab, you might be able to transcend this time and spatial uh, domain. So, the, my question is uh, can we, anyone uh, living today, be able to have this? attain the Sirmul Kitab to uh, you know, transcend. And what is the benefit or significance of having this uh, knowledge for this time? Particularly when this is mentioned in the story of uh, uh, people of the cave. It's something important for the present time. Okay. Thank you. It's a very uh, pertinent observation, a very important question, Dr. Mira. Sirmul Kitab. Uh, the reason why this subject was scheduled for today and this gathering was to provoke precisely that kind of research work that needs to be done. Most of our scientists pursue knowledge in a secular embrace and that secular embrace is hostile to religion. And so if you are a scientist and you're preparing a research paper and you make a reference to the Quran, that's it, your career is over. Your career is over. Because they look down upon religion. Bringing knowledge from the Quran is like bringing knowledge from Disneyland. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ قَالُوا أَنُؤْمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَاءِ Says the Quran. They look down upon religion. In, in Surah Al-Kaf, we have the story or the event of the encounter of Musa alayhi salam with Khidr alayhi salam. And Khidr alayhi salam embodies knowledge internally received. وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَلُنَّ عِلْمَ says Allah in the Quran. But when Musa alayhi salam said, I am the most learned of all men. And Allah said to him, No, you are not. There's one more learned than you are. And of course he's not Banu Israel. So this has, must have come as a rude shock to Banu Israel. There's someone who is not an Israelite and who is more learned than the Israelites. <laughs> he says, I want to meet him. That servant of yours who is more learned than I am. <coughs> and Surah al told us that you would meet him at Majma'ul Bahrain. 
at the place where the two oceans meet. And Imam al-Baydawi in his tafsir recognizes this to be religious symbolism. He recognizes this ocean to symbolize knowledge externally acquired and that notion, that ocean to be symbolizes knowledge internally received. And so yes, we have to bring all the verses of the Quran pertaining to the subject of our relations with the Samawan. Bring them all together and try to bind them all together as a harmonious whole. But I can't do that. No. Because you need to have Majma' al-Bahrain. You need to have also studied the subject from the viewpoint of physics. You would have studied quantum mechanics, you would have studied the theory of relativity. You have studied all that modern physics has given to you on the subject of the different dimensions of space and time. And when you bring these two worlds of knowledge together, this is Ilm al-Kitab, not just what is in the Quran. Because the Kitab is directing you towards that as well. And it is my hope and prayer that from this gathering here today there might be someone who will take up a PhD thesis on the subject and will do what Einstein could not do because Einstein did not have the Quran. Salaam alaikum. My question is that as you described the sort of the and uh, the story of uh, the people of the faith in terms of the different time and spatial dimensions. However, I mean, it's a good uh, attempt to understand uh, many, you know, narrations in the Quran, to understand the mystery, to understand the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will keep unfolding with the, you know, discovery in, and invention of science. Because Allah says that, so no him, fi ayatina, so that's okay because Allah, Allah, I mean, basically this ayat tells that the scientific uh, inventions and discoveries will establish, you know, the, the, the facts that, that have been described in Quran. But at the same time, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, that penetration in different time and space dimensions, it's not. Uh, capability of every person, rather according to the human being, is especially granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this light, I would like to know what is the ultimate lesson and lesson from this uh, story of uh, the people of Kish, because the Quran has been as a, uh, as a, as a Nasiya and uh, you know, as a lesson to the mankind. So in this perspective, what you will advise to our this, you know, the present day Muslim Ummah and especially this uh, gathering of uh, our intellectuals and students to overcome the present scenario uh, and, to, and to deal with the you know, present circumstances in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> The Quran itself answers your question. That the story or the event of Ashabul Kaf, Allah says, He has caused this to occur in order to teach the subject of time. That is the answer to your question given not by me but by the Quran. And therefore the ball is now in our court. We have to do the homework. You do not study the Quran piecemeal. If you do that, then at the very beginning of the Quran, Allah gives you the mother of all warnings. That this is lazy scholarship. 
that he ordered the angels to make sijda before Adam alayhi salam fasajadu illa iblis so as a lazy scholar you say well the angels were ordered to, to make sijda before Adam alayhi salam and they all made sijda except iblis the inescapable implication, can't get away from it, is that Iblis was an angel. This is lazy scholarship. And Allah is not deficient in the use of language. No. This, con this sentence is constructed this way deliberately to teach, to teach, to teach usul tafsir to seek to teach methodology for the pursuit of knowledge for the study of the Quran as you broadcast on CNN and Al Jazeera that Iblis was an angel and it is already known all over the world then you continue now with your study of the rest of the Quran and then you get a shock. Oh my gosh. What a mistake I have made. This lazy scholarship has landed me in a mess. Because the Quran tells us angels don't have any free will. No. وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ Whatever they are ordered to do, they have no choice. They must do it. So when Allah ordered them to make sijda, they had no choice. They had to do it. But that fellow had choice. He could choose to obey or choose to disobey. And he chose to disobey. He cannot be an angel. What a mess I've made of my name now because it's bandied all over by CNN and Al Jazeera. I said that Iblis was an angel. Yeah? And I don't have the time to continue the analysis. But then Surah Al Kafta said, Okay, I mean, Al Jinn. Yeah? So that is lazy scholarship. Proper scholarship is to begin with Surah Al Kafta with the story of the young men in the cave لِنَعَلَمَائِيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَالِ مَا لَبِيْتُ عَمَدًا to teach the subject of time and then go to all the rest of the data in the Quran locate all the rest of the data in the Quran and seek to bind them together as a harmonious whole my teacher Rahimahullah in his book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, in two volumes, he calls this the system of meaning of the subject. <coughs> when you've located that system of meaning of the subject from the Quran, then you go to the Ahadith. And you will now incorporate into your database those Ahadiths which are in harmony with the Quran. And when you find a hadith like this one in Bukhari, he married her when she was six and consummated the marriage when she was nine. When you find something in the, in the hadith which is manifestly in conflict with the Quran, you stay with the Quran, not with that. You see? And so you, you, have, to, you have to now do your homework, as I say in the Dr. Mira. The scientists in our community of Muslims, the scientists, you have to do it, not Imran. You have to take the totality of the data in the Quran on the subject of the different dimensions of space and time. You have to bind them together as a harmonious whole using your knowledge of physics or whatever is a branch of physics. It's not astrophysics, it's some other branch of physics. You will have that knowledge of the external world derived from the external world with which to be able to spot 
to recognize and to bind this database into a harmonious whole. And then turn to the ahadith to complement what is in the Quran and to expand the database. And then you'll be able to explain the subject. What I have done today, I have done what I could do. I can't do more than this. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, yeah, she, uh, actually, um, this is not a question, but basically just an opinion. Just an, uh, because you uh, pose the hypothesis on the possibility of human being to be simultaneously, to be in the material universe and the samawat. So, there are two things which I uh, you, you, you find very, very close to this, I mean, very, very, very linked. One is sleep, because every time when God talks about shifting the, uh, the time, the dimension, God always associated with sleep, like in the Surah Al-Kaf or Surah Al-Baqarah on the traveler. And there's another thing is on the light. So basically sleep, there's a period of time where we have this uh, 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 state of REM, rapid eye movement where we are indulged in deep sleep and where we are trained and on that. Allow me to interrupt you one second, please. Yes, sir. I should have mentioned not only sleep. The Prophet said, as salatu mi'arad al Namely, it is possible to travel while in Salat. Alright. Hello. Okay. Uh, that's another thing. It is also very linked to, to, to know, to light. When we talk about the theory of relativity, we talk about the uh, moment relative to each other, except for Einstein said, except for light. So basically, light travel is not in relative to other things and hence the time-space continuum theory. So I am in the opinion that uh, like sleep and like the Surah Abu Zamil where, where God asks you to wake up in the middle of the night and then there's a hadith where the, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked us to sleep, take a short sleep before Subuh, right? Before, before the Subuh prayer. So there might be there's some link there uh, between the, the time of sleep you, you ask, you have to sleep and then you wake up and then you have to sleep back to get back to your time. Uh, and then the, the light. So traveling, if you are able to move uh, in the speed of light by through the uh, particle accelerator, now we have this, uh, uh, like the particle accelerator, we try to accelerate particles. So the speed of light, you want to see the effects. So basically this is an, just an opinion. I don't know whether people have other comments to that. Are you on the staff or were you a student? I was a student. You were a student? You're no longer a student? No. Okay. Uh, perhaps you're the one to do the PhD? <laughs> yes, because I am very pleased with your comments. Uh, and it shows that there is some promise. Uh, I... <coughs> <coughs> would like to encourage amongst the graduate students somebody who would take up the subject at the doctoral research level um, and uh, uh, try to penetrate the subject. Um, my last comment really is that you will not, unless Allah allows you to, you cannot unless Allah gives you nur. And Allah will, put, will not put nur in your heart when your heart is cluttered up with rubbish. When the mind is cluttered up with rubbish. So you need to first take a bath. Ghusl. How do you take ghusl of the mind? Huh? The bustle of the mind takes place through the continuous recitation of the Qur'an. Reciting the Qur'an means reciting the Qur'an cover to cover, cover to cover, all through your life. Uncle Sam is going to be very angry with you if you do that. You know Uncle Sam? Modern Western civilization which has dazzled mankind 
absolutely dazzle mankind and there is so much, so much in modern Western civilization that is a mirror of what is in Islam. Mm -hmm. Except they're doing it better than we are doing it. Modern Western civilization also has within it the destruction of the religious way of life. Absolute destruction of the religious way of life. So <coughs> they will be very angry with the people who insist on eating with your hands. How oh, barbaric. Eating with your hands. But you can't get a Malay to eat curry fish and rice with knife and fork. I won't be Malay. You could get him to do that in Islamabad in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But not the Malay. <laughs> so recite the Quran cover to cover. And as you continuously recite the Quran, it cleanses the mind and the heart and washes away the rubbish. Number two, the Prophet said that one of the signs of the last day is that women would be dressed and yet naked. Hmm? <coughs> if you move to the remote countryside, you know the job doesn't go there. Kampung. And you know you're in Kampung when you cannot use a cell phone. Now you're in Kampung. And you never see a woman dressed and yet naked. Hmm? And then one day you come back to KLCC. The first time you see a woman dressed and yet naked, your heart will begin to shudder. Oh my gosh, this is what the Prophet said would happen. Look, here it is before my eyes. And then fear, fear will envelop your heart. And then anger and then sadness and all kinds of things. And then finally you remember Man ra'amun karan fa yuvayir hubiyali Change it with your hand. I can't change it with my hand. The modern feminist revolution has come to stay. And if you can't, then change it with your tongue. You can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, they're not going to change. And if you cannot, then you will change it with your heart. How do you change Munkar with your heart? This is my answer. If I cannot change it with my hand and I cannot change it with my tongue, then the way that I change it with my heart is to depart from it. Depart from it. I will not live amongst you. So long as you're using this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper currencies, and I can't change it, I'm out here. I will not live amongst you. When you do that and you move out, you distinct, you distance yourself, you withdraw, you disconnect, which is what they did in Surah al -Kaf. Then the purity of the heart will be restored. The innocence of the heart will be restored. Illa man atallaha bi qalbin salim. Salim al qalb. The heart will be restored to its health, its innocence, its purity. <coughs> It is that heart which can receive no. It is that heart which can then, the, then do the doctoral research to penetrate the subject. But if the heart is such that you see them dressed and yet naked, morning, evening and night, nothing happens in the heart. No. It's commonplace now. Then that heart is not fit to receive no. The last question from on this paper is, is it halal if we use the knowledge to preserve human life for 300 years? Is it halal? Is it halal? Yes. To 
to use this knowledge to preserve human life. Can we call it halal? Can we, if we pursue this knowledge and it is something that we possess now, do we use it to preserve life? I mean, this is, I think, it's an application problem. I have a question now. I really cannot answer the question now. What I would like to ask is that you attempt to answer the question, how is it possible? How is it possible for the bodies of the young men to be most certainly located in this material universe? In the world of space, because left and right, in the world of time, because morning and evening, because sunlight, and yet, and yet, be in another world of space and time, non-biological, where you can have the passage of 300 years and yet not age biologically. That is the question I pose in my lecture. That question cannot be answered until you penetrate the subject of time. Einstein has done his work. Where are our scholars? This is a cry from, this is not my field. I am in the field of history and politics and economics. Politics and economics and history and so on. This is not my field. But I am here to make a cry for our scholars to come forward and do what Einstein could not do because he didn't have the Quran. So he can able to answer this question. All praise and grace is due to Allah. We've come to the end of the lecture section. Uh, I've been asked to also announce that um, there will be a subsequent program on uh, eschatology, that is um, the knowledge of uh, which the president has just presented now, and that in due course uh, would we'll make this um, announcement known to us, please, um, as usual. You'll be our guest and we'll be glad to have a few hours like this once again. Uh, I'd like also to call on Professor Shafi to make the presentation of uh, uh, thanks to our esteemed uh, teacher who has given us um, this rare opportunity of listening to this uh, part of the Quran that is not often discussed. Inshallah, the Sheikh will also be um, around much later in the year, but uh, his itinerary is full. If you want more information on his, uh, uh, his talks, you can go to his website, check on his talk. And also, uh, I'm using also this opportunity also to retreat that he is interested in students taking up the subject of an eschatology. Uh, please, if anybody is interested in this area, please uh, see him personally uh, before he leaves. Uh, Alhamdulillah, so we'll recite the closing work while asking.